Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're starting a brand new game on the channel, in Suzerain. So Suzerain's not a new game, it's been out for almost a year now. It came out in December of last year, and it was recommended to me by a fellow subscriber, and I took a look at it, and it seems very interesting. So the objective of the game is to be the leader of this fictional country and make decisions for it. It's sort of a country management, political science sort of game. Um, a lot of it is uh, through text, uh, decision making. Not the most graphically intense game, uh, but it's quite interesting making these choices. And we recently played Frostpunk on the channel, where we had to make many ethical dilemma decisions. And this one is a bit more uh, relevant to uh, the modern world in a sense. And suzerain as a word, uh, probably those who play civilization is quite familiar with it as you deal with city-states uh, by trying to become their suzerain. It's a French word. Uh, I think the root is Latin. Uh, sus is like above and the rest of the word is from sovereign, so to rule from above. So you essentially, uh, it's almost like a puppet state where your policies are decided by someone else. In this case, I don't know why it's the word picked, because I believe you're actually becoming the president of the country, but I could be wrong. And for those of you who have played this game, I kindly ask you to don't spoil it in the comment. I have never played the game, and I know there are many endings to it. I don't want it ruined. I want my first run through release here to be based on my own opinions and see how we end up as a country. So let's find out if I can actually run a country. So let's get started. All right, we have ourselves a timeline. 1908, Kingdom of Sodland. Uh, everything is fictional, but I would assume it's based somewhat you know, grounded in history and historical events. We'll see if we can pick up anything. You open your eyes to this world you came from. So this is our birth in 1908. I believe the storyline takes place in the 50s though, uh, but let's see. We could be from a wealthy background, a middle income background, or an impoverished family background. Um, I guess at this point, we don't really know, and it's really just up to what I want to do for this run. And I think we'll just take, we'll take the wealthy family. We'll look at the world through an upper class lens and see how that affects our decision. Lock Haven. Your parents name you Anton. As the only child of a success successful businessman, you had the chance to grow up in a wealthy family. Life was easy at first, and you had the best education money could afford. However, things inside the Rain family changed due to the absence of your father. This affected your mother and you negatively. The years pass. So our name is Anton Rain. We'll be 15 here, September 9th, 1923. During a history class at school, the bell started to ring unexpectedly. You heard a loud commotion outside. As everyone tried to figure out what was going on, the principal announced the historical revolution. The kingdom was no more. The Republic of Sutland was born. You did not fully understand. You're happy that you had the day off. You were somewhat worried. Hmm. At 15, I would not have understood, I guess. Three years later, 1926, we are officially 18, graduating high school, I guess. After graduating, you passed the university exam with high marks. You had the opportunity to choose between several studies. You chose to study law, economics, or history. So. Um, I guess a little bit about myself. Uh, for those of you who follow the channel, you know that I'm very big into history. But what you might not know is I am not schooled in history. 
history is entirely a hobby for me, and I actually did study one of the three choices here. I studied uh, business school uh, when I went to college many years ago. So we're gonna keep with that, and it happens the school is in Lock Haven, so we get to stay home, uh, which is always a plus, I guess. Uh, I guess when you are 18, you don't feel like it's a plus. I went to college in a city far, far away from my home, but uh, regardless, let's pick economics here, something that I will be more familiar with. During the first year, you attended a lecture with David Vis Visi. He was a well-known diplomat from the foreign ministry and the son of the president. After observing the hall in silence, he explained why a market economy is the better option for Sutland. He argued for a system where prices for goods and services are determined by the open market. You agree in principle, you question what you were being taught, your only concern was passing the exam. Ooh, first year, huh? It would be this one. Now, is a market economy a better option for Sutland? Depends on what the economic structure of Sutland was and is currently. It's not, you know, the solution for all. Um, there are pros and cons with any system. But I guess we will just say we are a student. We care about what's going to be on exam. May 22nd, 1927. The coup of 27. So we would be a graduate. We would be... Oh no, this would... Yeah, we would be what? 19. Oh, this would still be our first year then. Soldiers enter the campus in the evening ahead of the first election. Many were in shock as the uniformed men created a security cordon and started arresting the teachers. A group of students started gathering in protest along with your best friend, Peter Vectern. You decided to... Ho. Oh. Right. So fortunately, as someone who grew up during a peaceful time, I never had to experience anything like this, so I can't say for sure what I would have done in real life. But knowing myself, I probably would have avoided any confrontation. And stayed out of the way. You, you heard a loud announcement that echoed through the campus. General Lutheran declared martial law in order to restore the administration. Please stand back and disperse to your rooms. You quickly made your way toward the dormitory, avoiding the scene. You did exactly as they said. As you enter the room, you heard screams coming from the outside. Oh dear. Huh. See, this is where things get a little bit complicated. Assuming we're in the dorms, the scream will be from our friends, right? Like, this will be personal. I think this we would actually go try out, well, I would go try out and see. But the soldiers locked the door. It was a gloomy year. October 10th, same year. The majority of the students and teachers displayed their opposition. Thus, Lockhaven became a target for the military regime. You didn't want to stay idle and decided to join a human rights group, a student council, or a political debate group. Oh, wow. Probably the political debate group, actually. The dozens of debates helped you hone your oratory skills while also helping you grow your network. Even though the debates were pretty heated between different groups, you all grew from sharing ideas. In one of the meetings, Peter introduced you to one of his friends, Monica, who was a volunteer for the Swedish League of Women. You were immediately attracted to 
are intelligence, beauty, and diligence. Okay, definitely not diligence here. I mean, I think there's no wrong answer between the first two, at least for myself. There's no context. Can you provide a picture, please? I would like to think highly of myself and go with this, her intelligence. The politically charged environment led you to join the Red Youth, the sh Socialist, join the Young Swords, the Nationalists, stay away from any political organizations. Okay, so this is a, I mean, 1920s rise of communism, rise of fascism. So we're in the right time period. Um, I would personally stay away from any political organization. I don't like labels. June 2nd, 1928. The radio relayed that the communist general Richard, R Ricard surrounded Lutheran and his troops, demanding their surrender. They refused, and heavy fighting broke out across the country. You just couldn't believe it. The army was fighting amongst themselves. Swordland plunged into chaos. The clashes escalated into a full-blown civil war. The horrors made you isolate yourself for a while. Monica helped you cope, and love grew between the two of you. However, it was a difficult time for love. The chaos must end. I mean, we are 20. 1929, Republic of Sutherland. The charismatic colonel, Tarquin Sol, orchestrated a sudden coup and brought an end to the chaos. He wrote a new constitution and restored stability. The people saw him as a savior. He formed the United Sutherland Party and ran as a presidential candidate in the first ever election. Oh, wow. I would probably not vote, actually. I'm coming off as pretty... apathetic in this case, but... I'm gonna stick to it. June 1929, the USP, United Sutherland Party, won the election by a large majority. After graduation, you kept seeing Monica and noticed her interest to marry. To marry. Okay, so she wants to get married. However, a letter arrived from the military, calling you to fulfill your compulsory service. So it was time to serve our national or my national duties. February 1930, Bergia region. A devastating civil war broke out in the neighboring country of Wayland. The distinguished major, Isof Lencia ordered you to lead your squad on a border patrol mission. It was a very cold winter night when you began marching out of Gumrin outpost. You could see your breath. After several hours of marching through the snowy hills, distant noises were heard. Visibility was too low to confirm the source. The squad crawled forward in formation and found a spot to observe. A group of refugees had made it beyond the border fence. You. Oh man. Some more background would be nice. Hmm. Escorted them back. We are border patrol. The refugees were in despair when they realized you were taking them back to the border. Screams and protests ensured as they were restrained. You delivered them to the border guards. After several months of military service, your duty ended and you went back to civilian life. 1931. You and Monica decided to share your lives together. After receiving the blessing of her parents, a ceremony was held in Hosord. A ah, different city now, huh? During the same year, you were offered a high-paying job at the governing USP. 
It was important to start your career on a good foot, so you accepted it. Working for the ruling party was the easiest path to power. The financial competition was too great to pass up. It was the best opportunity to change the country for the better. Ooh. The only clues here is this high paying job. <laughs> Let's be real here. We are just married and we are here for the money. You became the economics assistant to one of the more experienced members of the assembly. You worked long and hard, staying late at work, investigating hundreds of pages of economic reports. You were climbing the ladder. September 1933, or 25 years young, Seoul strengthened the republic, this is the new president of course, by removing the institutions and symbols of the former kingdom from society. Things were also looking up for the country as the massive economic boom continued. People were the happiest they had been in a decade. Election time came and it was decided. The president was elected once more. April 2nd, 1934. A new five-year plan and the subsequent work regarding finances put you under a lot of pressure. But your significant contribution to the economic strategy triggered an invitation to meet President Tarquin Seoul himself, who offered you a key position. You were to become the youngest member of the assembly. We have to accept, but uh, we have to play it one way or the other. Let's do it with doubts. These things are always questionable. In June of 1938, as the youngest MP, it was difficult to connect with the influential inner circle. You needed allies, so you brought Peter as your right-hand man. The birth of your son, Frank, provided a brief moment of joy and relief. You sacrificed work to spend time with your family. You sacrificed family to improve your position in the party. I'm going to stick with family. This is the party that, I mean, position in the party. I figure this is our background story, right? To see how we became the leader. I'm going to spend time with the family. It's our firstborn son. I do value that. October 1941. During your absence, Peter found trustworthy contacts and strengthened your position in the party. At the same time, President Seoul increased his authority over the years. His growing ego started to cause strife within the party. The cracks began to show. Fourth election, by the way. October 1945. President Seoul barely secured a majority in election against the opposition, opposition leader. Over the past year, people were growing discontent with the corruption and the worsening quality of life. Meanwhile, calls for a United Sortland Party Congress became louder as a leadership struggle started to brew. You watch from the sidelines. <laughs> July 1946. The contender for party leadership was Edward Alfonso a reformist and a talented business magnate with a growing popularity within the party. Meanwhile, in a desperate effort to secure votes before Congress, President So was meeting party members one by one. He approached you too. The President offered you the position of Minister of Economic, Commerce and Energy in the next government if you backed him in the upcoming vote. I accept. August 1946. The party congress was nothing short of impressive. The banners of United Sutherland were decorating every possible spot. Thousands of influential political figures, lobbyists, and benefactors gathered for this turning point. The voting for the party leadership begun. And we vote for the president. I know, you guys might think after five elections I might not support him. But that doesn't automatically make the opposition better. 
we know even less of him. And we will be given the position of power, or at least we hope, to spread our influence, perhaps for the better. I mean, at this point, he must be very old, too. Ah, but I have a feeling that he might do something. Let's see. September 1st, 1946. Unfortunately, so lost leadership vote to Edward Alfonso with a small margin. During the Congress, so announced his retirement from politics. The systems he had established were to stay much longer. His achievements wouldn't be forgotten. You didn't care about who was in charge. Guess he's still the party chairman. October 15, 1946, a month later, your daughter was born. Monica named her Deanne. Uh, De Deanna. She motivated you during a tumultuous period in the party. Wait, who? My daughter? My wife? This she is not very clear here. The general elections were approaching. The United Salem Party was under the new leadership of Edward Alfonso. You. Uh, right, because he basically wins. He, he becomes, Alfonso is the chairman, so he's representing the party for the general election. I mean, as a member of the party, I'll do my best to campaign for him. 1949. During the general elections, the main opposition leader was embroiled in a sex scandal with his secretary. He was replaced by the strong opposition figure, Fern's rector, but the damage had been done. The extensive privatization program proposed by Edward Alfonso secured election victory for the United Sutherland Party. Over the next years, you did your best in order to make Sutherland a better place. Yes. That's why we are in government. 1951, the presidency of Edward Alfonso saw many bold reforms. It was followed by a serious economic recession. The other parties announced their bid for the 1953 election, but the unfair system hampered all opposition effort to win. You thought your party could not survive another crisis? We're worried about the economic recession. Together with Peter, your presence in the USP grew, and you became the face of a new wing in the party. You effectively took over the leadership as President Alfonso lost control of the country. The moment to make a move had come. You... Hmm. Blame him on TV. Bribe and extort his inner circle. Advise him to step down. Advise him to step down. January 1953. He didn't take your advice seriously and started to reshuffle his cabinet but most of his inner circle abandoned him. Your diplomatic attitude made the party vote you in as the leader. Following this, you announced that you would be running for president in the general election with Peter as your running mate. It was your turn. Uh, hold on. Okay, we get a little blurb. October 1953, after visiting every city and town during the election, you made a speech on state television. You promised to... These are the only two choices? Really? Enact diplomatic reforms. Preserve national values. Can I do neither? It seems like this country is fairly diplomatic. After, you know, the coup of 27, it has an end of civil war in 30, but it, it has been elections every single year. And there is a strong opposition party, as well as internal party leadership struggles within the dominant USP party. We're currently in the economic crisis. Can we fix the economy? That's what I want to say. But let's preserve national values here whatever the national value of Sutherland is. Great nation of Sutherland, 
due to the incompetent leaders leadership. Enemies, both internal and external, are influencing our glorious nation. Oh wow, we're coming off as fascists. Today, more than ever, we need to unite under one flag and protect our value. Gretzky Sutherland. Okay. Broadcast ended. November 5th, 1953. On election day, millions were to cast their vote. It's time to face the truth. So basically, we decide, are we going to lose the election? Don't we automatically win this? The game has to start with us in control, right? Chapter 1. President Rain. That's us. That's me. Anton Rain. Ooh. We're going to have a picture. We're the fourth president. Balding, long, bald, movie star, rebellious, stylish, 20s, gentleman, gentleman's hat. Oh, there's a style fedora. That's. I don't feel like we need a hat. Let's just go with the. What's the difference between the oh comb over for the gen we'll, we'll keep the gentleman facial hair how old are we this is fifty three we were born in 08. we are forty five okay let's continue with the gentleman theme. Huh, this reminds me of Zhongshan Zhuang, a classic clothing style during the Republic of China. This is a very nationalist approach, I guess. We'll go default. Don't really want to make a message with our clothes. I don't wear any glasses, nor do I smoke. The office is fine. All right, that is us, that is me. Yes. Election promises. As Anton Ray, you have made many promises to the people of Southland in order to gain their votes. They must be considered very carefully. Economy. Southland's economy has been based on a planned doctrine since its formation until the former president. Edward Alfonso enacted free market reforms. Now the country finds itself in between two different economic systems. So we can promote either one, promote free or plant economy. Is there some stats to this or am I just going to base like entirely on, I guess we can base it on a little bit of history. Diplomacy, the intensified global rivalry between capitalist Arcasia in the West and the communist United Cantana in the East is opening new diplomatic possibilities. Sutherland could take steps to align itself closer to one. Immigration. In recent years, Bludish, Wiktik, and Agnolian immigrants flocked to Sutherland due to relaxed immigration laws enacted by Edward Alfonso. As a result, tension in between Sutherland and immigrants have been increasing. Ooh, okay. This is our map. Looks like there's some coast. And we have some inland neighbors. We're gonna stay neutral diplomatically. 
we will stay with the Titan immigration policy. And we will promote free market. Term focus. We have also promised to focus on a certain extensive subject within our first term. The people expect us to solve the negative situation within this topic while providing an overall improvement to the related policies. Health. Since the 1940s, the difference of service qualities between urban and rural hospitals has been getting increasingly worse. The average life expectancy has dropped significantly. Education. The lack of school, teachers, and even classroom equipment in certain areas caused massive gaps in the previous ro previously robust economic system. Law and enforcement. Increased crime is pushing law enforcement to their limits. Well, judges at court deals uh, courts deal with a huge and expanding backlog of legal cases or military. The military protects the country from hostile threats, and while some see it as a massive financial burden, other argues it is a critical deterrent. Oof. There's two in particular I'm leaning towards, and that's education and military. One is the foundation of the country, and one is the foundation of the future of the country. Hmm. We'll start with military, actually. This ensures, or hopefully ensures, that we have a second term to fix things like education. Two weeks has passed since we won the election. Okay. And now I was about to be sworn in as the fourth president of Sotland. Thousands were watching the inauguration ceremony and cheering my name. Anton Ray. The die was cast. Do, do I only have one choice? I, uh, I only have one choice. The die was cast, and there my story began. In the distance, the Maroon Palace stood on top of the famous Hill of Pride. I had no way of knowing what the future awaits for me here. Ah, oh, they have a lure. The Maroon Palace is where the executive branch of the Swordish government is situated. It was constructed to serve as the summer residence of Abrik uh, Renan, but quickly became a structure of political uh, importance. The turning point was when the Kingdom of Soiland was announced from the balcony of the palace, reflecting the shift of government power from Uroy to Holsod during the transition period. The Maroon Palace received its name from the Maroon painted exterior walls, it has a hundred rooms and several wings housing different branches of executive government. Underneath the structure is a highly secure situation room where the president is safe from any danger and evaluates any security crisis. And it stands on top of the famous Hill of Pride, which was named during the decoration of the Kingdom of Sotland when thousands of countrymen started proudly singing the new anthem of Sotland. It is located at the center of Halsord in between the most important government structures like the Maroon Palace, the Supreme Court, and the Grand National Assembly, and the Ministry of Interior. The Hill Pride is inside the large Capital Park, which gives the Hosordians a chance to relax from the city's stress with free time activities in nature. The Hill was a great symbolic, or has a great symbolic importance because the decoration of the kingdom and the Republic, which took place on top of it during the last century. Pretty cool. I looked at my family, my son and daughter, Frank. He's currently studying at Horsod's Markian High School, Indiana, which is attending an elementary school. In a brief interview, Monica Rain said she was named after her grandmother, who came in the 1980s, 1960s, 1860s, sorry, to Sutherland from Algonia with hope to start a new life. So an immigrant wife. Ah, beauty and intelligence, we can be proud of both, is the current first lady. She was born in Lockhaven to parents with anglo swordish background. She has a degree in sociology and has worked as social worker and later as the partnerships managers in Magnus Cartilis in the campaign assistant for Swordish League Women. 
Sounds like Magna Carta for some reason is the young NGO formed in Alfonso's period aimed to make Soyland a more diplomatic nation by introducing a new charter of rights. It supports humanist ideals and peaceful conference and protests. Some of the donors are from Arcasia. So we're going to, this is the West, the diplomatic West. And overall, the founders have seen a, as peaceful citizens who has a good moral standing. In the last decade, MC got attention through a whistleblower inside the USP who leaked damaging documents about Tarquin Sol. This has caused many to treat them as traitor of the state. The founder denies allegations of being a traitor, explaining that being a vocal citizen fighting for the well-being of the country has nothing to do with betraying the nation. Okay, so this is more of a diplomatic NGO. Then I turn toward the key people who made it all possible. Of course, each individual was promised an important position in my cabinet. So here comes Peter, I guess. Oh, maybe someone else. As my thoughts slowly faded away, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Or so, Hawker, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, was waiting for me. So he's a politician, jurist, and current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court since 1937. So he's um, been in this position for a good 18 years. He graduated from the Imperial Marquian uh, University, 1903, five years before we were born with a degree on legal theories. Later on, he started working as a public prosecutor, then as a judge at the local district um, court, until the fall of the kingdom. Wow, okay. During the first government of the Republic, he started working at the Ministry of Justice, where he became assistant and contributed to the legislative planning and constitutional law. He joined the USP after the coup in 29, and was elected as a member of the assembly, he was known to have close ties with President Tarquin So, who appointed him as judge of the Second Supreme Court in 1933. After the death of the first Chief Justice, Gregory Marcia, Orso was elected to his position by the court in 1937. The Hawker Corps handed down several landmark rulings that significantly transferred criminal procedures, taxes, and other areas of the law. Many of the court's decisions incorporate a highly controversial policy of Tarquin Sol, including the approval of the security package laws and ruling that the uh, Buddhist Freedom Party entering the election was unconstitutional, effectively removing the Buddhist identity from politics. As a staunch establishment supporter, he represented the majority of the Supreme Court, and he is regarded by some as the most powerful and divisive figure in Swordish politics. So we have a strong line, old conservative judge as the head of the Supreme Court. The time for the oath has come. So he, he's, you know, emceeing the event, I'm guessing. I am ready. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will respectfully execute the office of the President of Sodland and to the best of my abilities, preserve, protect, and defend the people and the constitutions of the Republic of Sodland. You may now deliver your inauguration speech, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Hawker. My fellow swords. The crowd looked very eager to listen to me. Ooh, message, huh? The idea of unity, the current dire situation, the change and hope. What are we selling here in our first term? I don't want to sell fear, but I also don't want to sell hope. Let's go with unity. For many generations, this country and its long history has kept us tied to an idea. The idea of unity and our people's right for a free and prosperous life. Our capability sounds good to me. Our workers are no less productive than a decade ago. Our capable minds are no less inventive. Our products and services no less requested than they were last week, last month, or last year. Oh wow, that is bold. 
I'm here to stop the recession and eliminate poverty first. I promise you, we will stop the recession and eliminate poverty. This might go against our military promise, but um, this is the message I prefer to sell. Our capacity as a nation has never been greater. Hundreds of thousands cheered. They were shouting my name in unison. I felt the responsibility, the power, and the burden all at the same time. Wave. I took a long, I took a long look at the people of Sunland to burn this moment into my memory. One of the pres presidential guards came by to notify that it was time to leave. I made my way to the leading car in the motorcade. The presidential state car was a jet black Cadillac, 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 uh, Cadillac, with flag of Sutland above the front headlights. Next to it, a man was holding the door. Serge Wachner. Hello, Mr. President. We can't click this, so we... Oh, this is our driver. We serve the... He's a presidential driver. Born in the small town of Nahir between Ezrin and Dyer. Wachner attended the Dyer Drastunist School. He then attended Houseward State University. After graduation, he had to leave the capital due to a lack of job at the time and briefly worked as a truck driver between the city of Anrika, which is right here, and our hometown of Lackhaven. He, entered, he later entered the Swedish Police Academy, but despite completing his training, he did not join the police force. He briefly worked as a private bodyguard in the Hosword before entering the special training course for the Maroon Palace. After completing his extensive training of protective driving, firearm first aid, and first aid, he joined the service of the Maroon Palace as a driver in 1930. He was tasked with driving various guests of state as well as transporting certain documents and goods to Maroon Palace. He was chosen to be the presidential driver in 1954 as being the most experienced driver in the service of the Maroon Palace, having served for over 20 years. So we don't really know Serge or Sergey. But um, we know he's experienced and uh, has an interesting past. Interesting how he didn't join the police force after, you know, going through the academy training. This is a question mark here. Still under the effect of the speech I made, uh, hearing my new title made me smile. If you allow me to introduce myself, I'm Sergey, your new driver. Nice to meet you. It's an honor. He respectfully bowed his head before opening the car door and gesturing inside. I entered the car. We'll be headed towards the palace. The motorcade began to move. On the way, Sergei proceeded to explain his duties as a driver. As minutes passed by, I found myself lost in thoughts again, barely paying attention to what he was saying. Well, that's rude. He suddenly made a gesture towards the now closer palace. Isn't it a beauty? The Maroon Palace. He was right. Sunlight glinted off the palace's many maroon-colored domes. It was so bright that I had to look away. Every time I look at it, I'm reminded of my duty to this nation. Hmm. As do I. Well said, Mr. President. The car drove past the majestic gates, continued uphill to the entrance, and stopped in front of the doors. Sergey got out of the car and opened the door for me. Have a great day, Mr. President. A uh, more... Morgan uh, West Core? Okay, he's referring to a famous sort of phrase from the time of the revolution. A Morgan West Core, Vectern Sesta, which means morning will come. Victory is close. Vector and Sista. I made my way upstairs through the extravagant corridor of the palace. Marbled and engraved wooden finishes decorate the interior. My footstep echoed in the colossal hall. The guards bowed their heads in respect as I opened the massive door to my new office. And we got a save. And that, actually, might be where we end things. 
as we'll come back and run this country next time. We got to see our uh, backstory. There's some news. There's a map of our land. Seems to be divided in what I'm going to call provinces now. Who knows what the official term is. This is our capital. I don't actually even see... Oh, we can move it. Ah, Lackhaven. That's our hometown right there. We have quite an interesting shape for our country. These will be neighboring countries. Agnolia, where our wife is from. And then we have the Diplomatic Republic of Valgrizdilen. And then we have a southern neighbor too, Republic de Lespia. And a western neighbor, Velen. We talked about their refugee situation as well. Interesting. Frinquel Seas, national capital, large cities, population over 1 million. Cities, small cities, breaking point being 100,000. International airport, national seaport, borders, regional borders, sea routes, rivers, roads, national roads, highways, railways, and electric, well, electric railways were that advance. The red line is highways, okay. Ribery. Interesting. Well, it's a very rich game. Uh, a lot of details already. And I'm sure once we run the country, it'll get even more detailed. And like I mentioned, please refrain from adding spoilers in the comment section. Or if you can't help yourself, at least put a spoiler warning and space it out a bit. So for those who don't want to read, like myself, I don't have to read them. So thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time as we'll come back and start running the country. Until then, bye!